Well, good morning, everybody. Happy April Fool's Day uh, from the uh, basement studio of Mr. Jim Boltz in the uh, Mumford Building on the great University of Illinois campus, which you see there in front of you. A beautiful, and I have to compliment Jim's uh, incredible drone photography of campus. This is an absolutely incredible picture. And uh, so I'll do credit to him. But welcome to everybody for the uh, webinar on the cover crop decision support tool, our cover crop analyzer tool we've been working on and developing uh, with our development team. Uh, you have on the on the line with us today, Dr. Shalimar Armstrong from Purdue University, who is our cover crop practices guru. He's going to walk you through some things on cover crops. Dr. Rabin Abatarai uh, here uh, at University of Illinois and, and the Agricultural and Biological Engineering College is going to walk through the modeling that we've got built into this. Sandeep uh, from the National Center for Supercomputing Applications here on campus, which is the development team that actually built the tool. And then unfortunately, you got me on here as well. Uh, and I'm going to try to demonstrate this tool without making any uh, major mistakes. With that, again, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, the Cover Crop Analyzer, this is a web-based tool funded uh, largely with uh, funds from the uh, Illinois NREC, uh, the Nutrient Research Education Council. And it is a demonstration of the power uh, for uh, translating science and research into usable uh, tools and usable applications in field. So hopefully you see that uh, using some of the incredible capabilities we have here on campus and, of course, with our partner institution over at Purdue University. And with that, Shalimar Armstrong, take it away and talk about cover crops. All right, very good. Glad to be here to share. Thank you for everyone uh, for coming. Uh, if you would advance the slide, there you go. So uh, I have several years of um, cover crop research, um, and I I do this by collaborating on farm with farmers. So so high interaction with farmers, and most farmers that I've interacted with and have talked to, uh, they they they're responsible. They want to have a farming practice uh, that fosters the principles of sustainable, uh, intensified agriculture, meaning uh, that they want to maximize production and uh, profit, right? While maximizing nutrient use efficiency, while minimizing the impact, negative impact on the environment. Advance. And so the easiest way to do this. Uh, is through uh, cover crop inclusion in conventional systems. So adding cover crops to the system. This is um, based upon the scientific body of, of the literature. Uh, cover crops gives you multiple advantages in order to make an aggressive move towards SIA. And so here's some of the, uh, the benefits that you get uh, when you uh, include cover crops in your system. This is not new to most. Uh, but definitely the original genesis of cover crops uh, started with this idea of reducing soil erosion, having a cover uh, in the fall and the spring on the soil surface to reduce the impact of rain droplets, right, that then generate surface erosion. Um, within the last 15 years, uh, scientists have discovered that nitrogen scavenging is a huge you know, a benefit and ecosystem service of cover crops, where we're seeing uh, at least 30 to 49% reduction in nitrate loss in, in tile drain landscapes, okay? And of late, uh, we're seeing that cover crops can increase or enhance uh, soil health uh, through, you know, physical soil health, whether that's better soil structure, aggregation, drainage, aeration, right? Or whether that's uh, chemical soil health, uh, where you're increasing uh, organic matter and the affinity uh, to hold on to nutrients, um, to keep them from uh, uh, leaching or, or moving through the soil profile, uh, and, and of course, building the master variable to soil health, which is soil organic matter, okay? Uh, there's also, uh, if this cover crop is a legume, you could add nitrogen uh, in the system from symbiotic fixation, capture of nitrogen from, from the atmosphere, okay? Cover crops have been also used to reduce uh, weed pressure, increase infiltration, and also to reduce soil 
uh, compassion. Proceed. However, uh, less than, <laughs> you think about all these benefits, but despite these benefits, less than 5% of row crop agriculture in the upper Mississippi River Basin has received cover crops or, or, or used cover crops, right? So there's some questions. Proceed. There's some questions that are remaining, okay? Um, and, and let me just walk through a couple of the questions that we plan to help farmers visualize answers to with our um, cover crop analyzer tool. Advance, yeah. So one question is, you know, how much biomass did I generate? Some some folk would think that's simple, but farmers, when they cover crop, they don't always know that they're generating, uh, you know, a thousand uh, pounds per acre of biomass, which is significant. The next question is, is you know, the biomass constituents. You know, how much nitrogen did I conserve in that biomass, right? Because if the nitrogen is in the above ground or below ground biomass then it can't be in two places at one time. It can't be in the biomass and in the atmosphere or in the biomass and in the tile drain water. So, so therefore, if it's in the biomass, in the field, you're keeping it in the field. Advance. Yeah, the next question is, you know, uh, how much of that nitrogen in the cover crop biomass through decomposition will be released to my cash crop and when? Very tough question. We're working on that. Then, you know, how much carbon, right, uh, am I accumulating uh, and, and, and in this above ground and below ground biomass, right, the, with this emerging carbon market, uh, carbon credits and farmers possibly being able to be paid um, based on their uh, increase in salt, organic carbon stock. The, the carbon in the above ground biomass is significant. It's significant. It could justify some of the adoption costs. Okay, and here are the other questions, right? Should I expect nitrogen immobilization, right? Uh, and if so, can I adjust my management in order to offset that? Another question is, you know, with this amount of biomass, you know, farmers could then anticipate, um, you know, how should I adjust my equipment? Do I need more down pressure? Do I need to get trash whippers in order to help me with this increased residue, right, from the adoption of the cover crops? And then last but not least, uh, what adaptive management are needed in order to maintain or increase yield, right? And so these are all uh, questions that still remain, uh, that farmers are still uh, trying to negotiate. And we think if we can present uh, to novice farmers or even to experienced farmers a way to uh, model uh, and visualize this data from their own phones and, and from their own laptops and, and iPads and so forth, uh, it would help them strategize uh, in order to adjust management, um, you know, to this this adoption of cover crops. So I'm gonna pass it on to Dr. Rabin. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about how did we uh, set up uh, this whole uh, simulation tool. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about the. Uh, the tool we are using, uh, uh, the model, is called uh, Decision Support System for Agro, agro Technology Transfer, uh, which we call in DSAT in the sword. For those of you who are familiar with some uh, crop and uh, soil and water system modeling. So for this model, uh, it's a, a very, I would say, one of the popularly used crop model uh, in the domain. Uh, and the crop science and ag engineering, we use this uh, uh, model uh, all over the world. And uh, the reason we use the model is popular because it can simulate actually over 42 crops, including your most of your cash crops like corn, soybean, wheat, and others. Okay, you can think about your 42 cash crop. Uh, and then uh, what the model can simulate is your it simulates your uh, crop growth and development, gives you your crop yield, but then it uh, based on your soil conditions, your plant and weather information that we need to supply to this model. So you can see the in terms of input to the model, we have to provide some soil information, okay? Uh, like your soil uh, hydraulic conductivities and soil, uh, uh, other uh, soil water properties. Uh, we also need to input uh, crop management, like when was planted, when is harvested. If you do the tillage, when was tillage, what kind of practice for tillage for fertilizer application, what rate, when was applied, at what method, right? Uh, for the weather data minimum that we need for this model is your 
daily rainfall, daily temperature, and it also looks at actually difference between different your variety of the crop, right? Sometimes you have your multiple uh, varieties, so between those varieties, you have different energy coefficient. And then model simulates your, uh, your water and nutrient dynamics and the crop growth on a daily uh, time schedule. So your model runs on a daily schedule and it gives you your plant growth and plant yield uh, as an output along with your soil water and nitrogen dynamics as well uh, from that uh, uh, simulation on a daily scale. Okay, next slide please. Uh, so uh, once uh, uh, your problem that we had in the beginning actually working with this project was then we wanted to use cereal rye, okay, which was your go-to cover crop for this region, right? Upper Midwest uh, for the winter condition. But then uh, we ran into this issue with uh, the DSAT does not have actually any model, uh, specific model for your cereal rye growth. So what we did was then we use a winter wheat. Uh, we tried to find out actually then what is your closest cousin, let's say, of your cereal rye uh, would be in the given 42 crop model in the DSAT. So we thought we found out that probably in terms of uh, uh, phen uh, phenology, uh, uh, your winter wheat probably the closest to cereal rice. So we use started with your winter wheat as a proxy model uh, for the uh, for the simulating the growth of cereal rice. But then, however, uh, as the literature said, that it's not the uh, exactly the similar. Uh, your phenomena for these two crops are actually. So uh, cereal rye is supposed to be more winter hardy than winter wheat. So that means your temperature, that actually kind of makes your uh, plant dormant and completely kills are different for those two crops, okay? So what we did then, uh, then we kind of try to uh, modify, okay? The lethal temperature for two conditions. One was your at which the plant start to die slowly in the beginning with the leaf. And then uh, at the temperature, you completely, the plant kind of sorts up all the photosynthesis, okay? So those two, two temperatures are the input in the model. So we modified that from uh, um, your minus 10, minus 15 for winter wheat Celsius, okay? To uh, minus, 20, uh, minus 25 uh, for cereal rice. So we modified that to make sure uh, we are simulating uh, uh, our uh, uh, modifying winter wheat into cereal rice to simulate uh, for our condition. Uh, so next slide, please. So these are some of the results that we got, okay? So uh, what we see here is then, uh, we actually try to uh, ca calibrate and validate for the model for the different conditions. So some of the data we have been using with actually coming from the exper experiments run by Dr. Salomar Armstrong that you guys just heard uh, before me. And he have been working with this uh, serial rye uh, field studies for last, I think several years now. So he have been doing a lot of field studies in, in Illinois and Indiana. And uh, so we have been using some of the data that you have been collecting to see then how does this DSAT model works in the different uh, your uh, cropping conditions. So we have run with the plots without cover crop, uh, with the different uh, management with cover crop, like uh, with the different management. So we are, we are trying to do is then we try to calibrate the model in one condition and then see whether the model can generate your replicate your biomass and your nitrogen and soil dynamics and other conditions. So this is your our uh, validation study that we did uh, with your uh, cover crop condition with your spring dominated uh, uh, fertilizer application uh, in the Lexington field in Illinois. Okay, so you can see in this three years, so you have seen, uh, so uh, this uh, green line in the map shows you the actually uh, simulated uh, biomass by the model uh, going from your September through uh, your next April, okay? Or whether the black dots represents your actually the biomass observed which was uh, the sample collection from the experiment and uh, with the matching, right? So for 14, 15 works well. You can see 15, 16 as well. Uh, your winter biomass was slightly higher observed than predicted, but like overall biomass was good. The same thing for 16, 17, you have these three years. And then as you can see, uh, uh, so the model kind of does a decent work in terms of your uh, simulating your cover crop biomass and then gives you an idea of then uh, what would be the good timing for farmers to actually go and then kill them or uh, uh, or uh, incorporate them in, into the soil so that you can actually uh, utilize some of those nutrients trapped in those cover crop for your subsequent your uh, cash crop, right? Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and then you can see again uh, validation where we did for like other year as well. So these are your uh, 17, 18, and 18, 19. So, uh, uh, as you can see, your blue line versus your black dots, kind of your model 
uh, did really, really, I mean, I would say like this and job in terms of predicting the cover crop biomass for those diverse years. And these are the actually numbers, not just for uh, one field, but we have done this simulation for multiple fields, a uh, different management and different conditions. So we have done uh, how does the DCAT works, let's say uh, some parts without cover crop, and then uh, we're trying to transfer those uh, similar parameter to let's say now let's try and see how does the model will do in terms of your uh, uh, other plots. And then we have seen that yeah, model does a decent work uh, in terms of uh, uh, simulating at least cover crop biomass. And we have also seen that model also does. We have actually uh, at the moment doing the validation work in terms of uh, your comparison of uh, water dynamics, especially the tile flow, because the tile, your subsurface then is kind of popular in this region. And then we want to see uh, the model is also doing good job in terms of predicting tile flow as well as nutrient loss in the tile, especially for nitrate. And then so that we can see uh, how much benefit you can have by implementing winter cover crop in your field, how much reduction you can get, not only by your crop uptake in the plant itself, but also like a uh, amount of nitrate that we can reduce from your tile field uh, in, the, in, your, in your tile loss as well. So now uh, I hand it to uh, my next call, uh, colleague from NCSA who's gonna talk about the background of web tool development. Thanks, Ravin. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you, you all can hear me well. Um, my name is Sandeep Putanvital Sadishan. I am a senior research program at NCSA. Uh, so here I'm actually representing a group of research software engineers, uh, design team, project management, who all have a, all have collaborated on this project, uh, you know, from NCSA. Um, so and I'm here to talk about the uh, the background on on the web development. Um, so let's so 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 far I think we have you know you know you know discussed about the importance of the cover crop as a practice as well as the availability of tools like you know dsat and other crop models out there which can you know help you predict uh, the outcome of application of cover crop on a, on a field so so now what uh, the the main thing is that you know we we observe that there is a, a need of a lot of expertise to use these tools which are very sophisticated and what we are you know the, our goal is basically trying to you know make sure that you know, we can reach uh, a wider audience through the use of scientific web applications so if you could uh, proceed um, to the next uh, uh, animation here so so the idea is that you know you, with the help of experts uh, you know like dr rabi and dr shalimar you know and uh, jonathan and others and, and of course like the farmers we can have all these like you know, different web applications which serve some specific purpose and what we have come up at NCSA is like a framework around which all these different web applications can be developed uh, you know, relatively quickly. Uh, one example is the uh, the cover crop analyzer that we are going to, that we are talking about today, and there are other examples from the FarmDoc suite of tools, the ARC PLC calculator tools around like insurance premium calculation, and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so if we proceed to the next slide, so this is the. Uh, the general uh, architecture of the cover crop analyzer, uh, you know, which is adapted from the the framework that I just mentioned earlier. So I understand that there are like a lot of jargons in this slide. So I'll try to explain, you know, some of these uh, these modules in a, in a simpler terms. Uh, at the center of this uh, um, module or, or the architecture is DataWolf, which is a workflow management software that developed by NCSA. So here, workflow management refers, in its simplest terms, refers to the idea that when you have a, you know multiple sets of software and you want to run them in a specific order with some specific uh, data inputs, uh, and then you want to repeat that for you know multiple times to get the same output, you use something called as a workflow management system. So in in this case, in the case of cover crop, you know there there is the software that gets soil data. There is a software that gets weather data. Uh, then of course the user uh, users field management information. All this is then fed into DSAT, which then you know runs the simulation for you and then uh, you know generates the results, which is then viewed in the web front end, which takes us to the next module. Uh, as a user, most of us uh, see only the web front end, uh, which is which runs in a browser. So that is the web application. You know you you use login uh, and then uh, you know set up simulation. Uh, monitor the jobs that are running, and then you know you can see the results. You can see the visualized results uh, through the browser. Um, the next module in this is a RESTful web service. I might not. I, I probably won't go a lot of you know uh, in depth into that. 
uh, but basically it provides uh, the capability to uh, have create, read, update, and delete operations on the data. Uh, probably the next uh, couple of modules are very important. Uh, the next one is um, the IAM or the Identity and Access Management, which gives us the capability to register users, to authenticate users, um, and then you know features like you know when you forget a password. So all those things are provided by uh, the IAM, uh, which is which we use Keycloak, which is an open source uh, you know software for identity and access management, which is very popular. Uh, the next module is the API gateway, which ensures that, uh, which helps ensure that you know a user can access only certain uh, backend services. So that is controlled through the use of API gateway. And there also we use an open source software called Kong. All this run within NCSA servers. Uh, it's just that you know some of these are we are using existing off the shelf uh, software available uh, you know through the open source community. Um, so basically, all the, the combination of Keycloak and Kong ensures that you know you as a user's data is protected, and you know only you can view and edit or delete your data. So if you move to the next uh, animation, uh, GeoServer is a module that helps with geospatial visualization. So you'll get to see in the next uh, you know in, during the demo stage when when you select a field, uh, for example, the CLU boundaries are marked. All those capabilities are provided through the use of uh, uh, GeoServer. And uh, the final module in this architecture is the database. All this information gets stored in a database, uh, including the, uh, uh, you know, the, the geospatial information uh, about all these, uh, the common land unit boundaries. Um, if you could proceed to the next, uh, yeah. So basically, th that's a database. And uh, you can uh, uh, move on to the next uh, slide, please. So if you if you're interested more to learn more about the architecture itself, uh, the framework itself, we have a paper that was published in 2019 uh, at an ACM conference. So you know, please uh, refer to this publication. Um, if you go to the uh, next slide, please. So I think that was the general uh, you know description of the architecture of the web tool, uh, and I'll leave you with some screenshots before we you know, proceed to the demo. And this is the uh, you know, the main URL. Um, of the uh, web application, and I, I don't think I'm explaining going to explain a lot. I think Jonathan will take it take from here. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Sandeep, uh, Rabin, and Shalimar for that great intro. Uh, we're getting some questions in, and we'll get to those after we get through this demo side of, part of things. Um, but really appreciate not only that the, the ex explanation you guys did, but the incredible work uh, that the team has put into developing this. Uh, and you have the cover crop tool, the analyzer on the screen in front of you. Um, all of you who are currently uh, uh, tuning into this webinar can access this uh, as well. Um, we had the website, just in case you missed it, the, uh, the website is covercrop.ncsa.illinois.edu or go to FarmDoc and we can get you the, you can find the links there on FarmDoc articles. We've put two articles out already on this. Um, and we'll continue to do work around it. So what, what I've gotten on the screen in front of you is the uh, front page of the cover, crop, uh, dem uh, the cover crop analyzer tool. And just a little bit of background about the project. You can see here, most importantly, of course, uh, this has been funded by the Illinois INREC Nutrient Research and Education Council, as well as some funding from Walton Family Foundation. Um, we had some initial seed funding from the Knight Foundation and the University of Illinois has chipped in as well. So. We really appreciate uh, the support that we have gotten thus far on this uh, and, and throughout this, this, this development. So once you get here, uh, for, for everybody that isn't signed in, I'm not going to walk you through a, the, the usual sign-in process. We're already uh, signed in. But if you go to this for the first time, you have to enter an email address and uh, create a password for it like you do for you know, most accounts. Everybody's pretty used to this by now. It'll send you a, val a verification email. And then you are, uh, you know, you verify that that was you. You prove you're not a robot. The whole, the whole sort of standard issue uh, sign-in material. Once you're in, you get to this page. Then we go into the cover crop analyzer. So we're going to walk through uh, basically how to get this started and how to um, use this tool. Uh, of course, there's some basic, you know, your typical click to uh, some background and, and other links for the project. What I want to do is spend some time here just walking through uh, how we how we get this started. So most of you uh, who have used any of the web tools are uh, pretty familiar with the mapping feature and, and how uh, all of this works. What you 
to start a job, we want to jump to my farm. You got to get fields into the system first and foremost. So we start by adding a field. You can go down here and obviously we're located here in Champaign-Urbana and we can uh, randomly pick fields um, or obviously if you're doing this for your own farm, you're going to use the fields that you know. We, we've got built into this the common land unit. This is what uh, FSA uses for uh, its programs. Uh, the, it's a little bit dated, and some of you have, if you've dealt with CLU before, you know there's, you know, it's, it's got its issues here and there. Um, we used uh, Josh Woodard uh, and his uh, development team. Uh, we're using their data input here for, uh, for the CLU. And again, it's not perfect, but it's our best uh, our best run of of connecting um, geospatially into the fields. So let's say we're gonna we select a, a random field, or we select our field here south of town, and we you can see our latitude longitude. You can see it highlighted on the screen in front of you, so you know the field you've gotten. You go in here and you're gonna type a test field south town one. So we're gonna give it a name. One of the features that we have on this is whether that field has subsurface tile drains or not. Obviously, that's going to make a big difference on nutrient loss issues. So in this case, we do select a, a, a subsurface tile drainage for this field. We add it. And note, the first thing we're telling you here is that um, this is pulling in data. So as, as Rabin and Sandeep walk through uh, kind of how DSAT and the modeling system works and how the, the tool development works, is a whole lot of data that's got to be plugged into this. Uh, and use. So we start with the CLU, and then we're pulling in a uh, cropland data layer. So that's going to give us a cropping history on that field. That's USDA's cropland data layer, public information. And it, you know, obviously could be off, and that will show you how you can update it for yours, your field. But this also gives us soil information from the Sergo database at USDA. So we've, we've selected our field, we've added it to our list. Um, and what you can do now is begin to see the, the information for this field. So my summary, uh, this is, uh, like I said, the, the data we have for the field. This can be updated. I'll show you that in a second. But we're looking at our soil types, um, our cropping history back to 2015, so our corn, soybean, corn, soybean rotation. We've got some basic uh, crop information in here. What we've done uh, on this side of this, and, and this is uh, Rabin's team, has uh, calculated what we understand to be sort of the average or the, the common um, management practices for the area. So this is, uh, you know, other than the cropland data layer we pull from USDA, this is a sort of default system that you as the user would want to uh, alter to better fit your exact field. But rather than have you do a bunch of data entry up front, what we've done is create a default file that will run this tool first, and then you can go back and start uh, adjusting field information if you want. I mean, you certainly adjust it right up front, but this gives you at least something to test run this before uh, doing a lot of data entry. Um, and if you want, again, to make some of those changes, we come into the cropping history, and we're going to go back into, and let's say, you know, 2019, I have a different, uh, I got different cropping system than, than what we have uh, listed there. And obviously you can see down through here, all of these, you know, the drop down menus, the, the things you can change, spacing rows, dates planted, dates harvested, your fertilizer application, all of this. Uh, and just to give you a quick example, if we increase my fertilizer a little bit here, for example, um, either type it in or, or run it up like this, you update, it's gonna tell you that you've updated now we know we've made a change to our system, and that will be built into the into the model. So, again, a whole host of things that we're not going to spend a, a bunch of time here this morning running through this. But this is where you get the, the the model to be more accurate for your field by altering this information and making it more uh, exact for for your field. Again, we've got field profile in there, some basics. Eventually, uh, and again, I, I should stress this throughout. This is uh, version 1.0. This is our very first. Uh, uh, rolled out development stage of this tool. We obviously have um, a whole lot of ideas and we welcome more feedback and ideas on how we can improve this and how we can make this more usable for the farmer. You know, one of those would be to be able to upload files off of your combine, off of your equipment. And so we're looking at, at a variety of different things that we would want to do for that. And, and hopefully, you know, 
thinking down the road a little bit, be able to get more accurate information and get it uh, more easily uh, uh, entered into this. Uh, obviously, cover cropping would be um, would be what we're looking at here. Uh, we've got none in there for now. Right now, we are running cereal rye, um, and again. Uh, one of the areas we, we obviously want to get to further down the road is how we add more cover crops, add mixtures of cover crop seeds, all kinds of, of potential things we would want to do with this model and this tool. Um, but, you know, you got to first build, you got to build the first part of this uh, to get started. So um, we, we are starting with cereal rye. We are running with cereal rye. I think Shalimar always calls it the workhorse of the cover crop um, system. And that's, that's where we're getting started. Uh, so again, I'm not going to add that now because I want to go and run run a tool, but I could go back into my previous years and alter this if I've got a cover crop history. Let's presume for now we stay with the fact that we do not have cover crops in this field. And I want to go back uh, and look at, in particular, when I go to run a, a job here, I want to look towards uh, my planting and harvest dates in this. So we're going to presume for a cover crop practice that you're going to establish that cover crop after harvest. So I've got a harvest date in here listed as, as September 28th, uh, and that's when I'm going to go back and now start a job. So I've, I've worked through the my farm information in summary. Now I'm going to run a, run a cover crop tool. Uh, and this is where Jim and I both get nervous that, that everything's going to work and that I don't mess up uh, with some serious user uh, error <laughs> in the working with this tool. So again, We've, we've picked our test field. We've got our field in there. We've got cereal rye as our cover crop. We've got our dates. Uh, we went back and said we were harvesting uh, on September 28th. So let's plant, let's say we establish our cover crop on September 30th. Now we're going to run it forward and think about when do I want to plant this cash crop? What's kind of my ideal date in this situation? I'm going to look, and you'll notice that this is interactive. So because we are at April 1, that's when we pop up the, the calendar. And let's just say we're going to get in there, uh, we'll call April 22nd. So as Rabin talked about with DSAT and Sandeep with the, with the database, how then are we dealing with weather? And obviously we are not at the stage of predicting weather for this tool at this point in time. What we're using is Illinois State Water Survey data. And we go back uh, 10 years of data and run it on an average base. So what's the average weather of the last 10 years? And that's the weather pattern that it defaults to. If you select uh, a hot year, it's going to go back in those 10 years and find the hottest year and run that and use that data or the coldest year, the driest year, the wettest year. So this is a very, you know, uh, rough weather <laughs> forecast. We understand that. In fact, uh, with funding from INREC this year and working with Trent Ford at the Illinois State Water, our state climatologist at the State Water Survey, we are working on trying to improve uh, the weather data and the weather capabilities in this. And so we do hope to roll out in the coming year uh, an updated version of this tool that'll have some better weather uh, functionality in it. But right now, we're just getting started with some of the basics. Once we get to that point now, we'll just keep it on the average weather from the last 10 years, and we'll just we'll just run a simple uh, first job. What, is this, what does this look like? So I'm going to make sure I don't uh, mess up my uh, my system here. So I'm going to call in Sandeep maybe and and Yep, talk about what's going on with DSAT and with the NCSA uh, uh, web system right at this point as we run through the circles. Sure. So I'm not sure how many seconds I've left, but you know what it does <laughs> is you know at this point it you know takes your field uh, the profile data which we call it as experiment file, and then it combines with the uh, the soil data for that field as well as the weather data. You know it all it all the things that are needed for DSAT in a particular format, it generates that data in that particular format, and then you know sends it to DSAT for simulation. So it, now it's running that simulation behind the scenes, uh, which after which you know it, it generates the data, which is again like reformatted into a way to be displayed on the screen uh, in the form of charts and numbers. So that's thanks, Andy. And the beauty of a, of a webinar, you didn't see me hold my breath uh, through that stretch, so that was great. Uh, and again, we're running this on a daily basis, right? So you're getting DSAT running the, the simulation on a daily basis over that cover crop time frame. Um, and again, correct me where I'm wrong on that uh, to the team. So this is, like I said, our first, uh, our first run at what we're visualizing for the farmer to use or the researcher in that case to use 
in the field. So we know we 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 uh, established our cover crop in uh, in late September, and what DSAT is estimating again, uh, Rabin certainly jump in or Shalimar jump in and and correct me or or uh, add more context to this as we go through. But what we're simulating out of DSAT or what we're visualizing from the DSAT simulation is what uh, we expect the plant biomass accumulation to be over time. And obviously, you know, during that that cold winter stretch, we're not going to see much accumulation as that as that crop is is going dormant. And then, obviously, the critical time frame into the spring. So, what kind of biomass is out there? What do we expect? You know, something Shalimar said about kind of your adaptive management. How much uh, biomass can we expect to be on that field? What's the carbon to nitrogen ratio of that? And that's a that's a critical matter. Um, in terms of soil nitrogen immobilization, which uh, Shalmar had mentioned, like sort of what's the state of, of the nitrogen uh, situation in that field? This, this will play into your decisions around not just termination and planting, but around your, uh, your possibly starter fertilizers or other needs you might need uh, to get that crash crop started. So this is giving you some initial information about the cover crop that, that you can use in your decision making and planning. Look, obviously, as this weather gets warmer and, and uh, we go into the spring, we're going to add biomass, we're going to have some some changes around that biomass and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So this helps with planning. You know, here's where we would love to have our forecasting information and give you some weather uh, information about, well, it, you know, five days from now, we may, you may run into some wet, a wet stretch. Therefore, you, you're going to want to think about how much biomass you have out in the field. So just a sense on, on what we what the science is telling us that, that the cereal rice should be doing in the field are our best estimate of that. Over here on the right-hand side, we've got our, our number results. So based on a uh, termination date of, uh, of April 22nd, when I put that in, we'd expect 1,857 pounds per acre, the plant biomass with a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 28.55. Uh, we have estimates, and this is from DSAT as well, is what is the nitrogen uptake into that cover crop? So this is that first stage of understanding how much nitrogen is pulled into the biomass. This is obviously nitrogen, as Shalimar said quite clearly, this is nitrogen not being lost to the air or to the tile and the water supply. So this is our scavenging aspect of this and our, our soil or our nitrate, nitrogen loss reduction efforts. Uh, you'll notice we've got a, a box for nitrogen loss reduction estimates, but we are still reviewing some of the data, still working on some of the calibration and, and, and verification of this. So we've actually pulled this down for now to, to double check uh, and triple check kind of how, how this is estimating out of DSAT compared with literature and, and research. And then yeah. we've got our growing, sorry, go ahead. No, Jonathan, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that our effort here um, is to provide some visual, visualization for farmers uh, at the critical management point. So most of the, the questions from farmers are, you know, uh, either at the beginning when they're trying to plant and figure out the best way to plant the cover crop, uh, the best rate and what mixture and so forth, seeding rates. And then the, the other critical management point comes in the spring as they anticipate the termination of the cover crop, if it's an overwintering cover crop like cereal rye. And uh, what, you know, uh, based on the growth during the fallow period, what what potential challenges would I might, would I see, you know, as it relates to um, uh, bringing in, terminating and then planting or sowing your subsequent cash crop uh, behind uh, that that cover crop, and so we we focused in on that window, uh, like a two week window uh, in the spring, where farmers are trying to figure out should I terminate now, uh, and if I don't terminate now in two weeks, what would the variables look like? What would my biomass look like? If I got two weeks more of of heat units, what would my CNA ratio look like? Right, and so ideally. We want to get to the point where farmers are comfortable with understanding, hey, if I get uh, over 1,200 pounds per acre of biomass, uh, it's going to start affecting my uh, corn yield. So, hey, I want, to, if I, I want to terminate before I get there, right? Or if you have soybean uh, coming uh, behind that terminate, terminated cereal rye, you could possibly let it go a little bit. And get more uh, more uh, ecosystem services for more cereal rye growth, and uh, most likely not affect your soybean yield. So uh, we wanted to we designed as a group uh, this system, uh, this model to to really hone in on the uh, 
the, the, the tough management decisions that have to be made um, uh, once we terminate that cover crop. Shalomar, thanks for that. That was fantastic. Um, and while while I've got you talking, let's walk through the, the most recent update of what we added this this tool. And this was in particular, this was a functionality funded by the Walton Family Foundation to look at decomposition. And this is uh, some of the fascinating work you've been working on uh, with your team. And maybe walk us through a little bit what the tool is visualizing at this point in time uh, and how it links back to this termination date. Yeah, so, so the next set of uh, questions that farmers would ask uh, as I present across the state and the region is, okay, uh, this cover crop has scavenged 40 pounds of nitrogen from my soil uh, and, and uh, it's produced about, you know, uh, 1,800 pounds of biomass. Okay, uh, how fast is, is it going to decay? And what's the, you know, what's the rate by which some of that nitrogen or uh, phosphorus or sulfur, right, uh, may, re may release back into uh, the soil solution uh, to be useful for the subsequent cash crop. And so basically, we, uh, we performed some analysis on um, cover crop, cereal rye, cover crop, um, residue decomposition. And based on our uh, data set, we developed um, uh, this model where, where you can see from the point where you terminate, um, number one, you can look at those light pink uh, lines that's with and without uh, spring tillage. All right, so that's a no-till and a spring-till system. Uh, that's the decay rate over, I mean, that's the decay of percentage of mass, biomass that you see on the soil surface and how it, and its disappearance rate over time, right? So where you have, um, uh, without tillage, you have a slower uh, uh, slope, right? Uh, and so your, your disappearance rate is slower. Right. And then and so you have more of a mass of residue on the surface. But where you have some spring tillage, of course, uh, th that residue disappears faster and you have less on on the soil surface uh, to deal with over time. So the other two lines that are green, the, the, the hash line and the solid line are the actual uh, rates of decomposition. Right. And so we see in the first, um, you know, uh, 30 days or so. Uh, your rate of decomposition, despite whether you are with tillage or not, uh, peaks, right? And of course, that decomposition rate peaks significantly greater uh, where you have some spring disturbance uh, of the soil. And, and we, we're not promoting tillage, but we, we wanted to show the contrast uh, so farmers would have a really good understanding of uh, how disturbance impact their residue. So in one sense, when you till, Right, uh, your peak uh, is is higher. The, the the disappearance of that residue is faster, right? And when you don't till, uh, you're in a no-till system. Uh, that peak is lower. Your disappearing rate is slower. And so when you fast forward to the end, uh, you have a greater percentage of that ca carbon uh, is still that residue is still on the surface where you didn't till versus where you did. And so your contribution of carbon to let's say the organic matter it's gonna be higher where you didn't till, right? And so we wanted farmers to be able to visualize this. So in other words, we, uh, um, uh, the figure above takes you from planting to, to termination. And this figure below, the decomposition after termination takes you from termination uh, to um, the place where you're harvesting. And you can see the rate of disappearance of your residue, which is an indicator, an indicator only, of the, the rate of possible nutrient release, right? The rate of possible nutrient release. And just because it's released, that's a that's a warning disclaimer. Just because <laughs> it's released, it doesn't mean that the actual crop sees it. You have uh, this microbiome, this microbial community that has to uh, use some of that nitrogen to metabolize uh, the carbon that's in the residue. And so they absorb a significant portion and slowly gives it back over time. Thanks, Shalimar. And that that's a great example um, to what you'd said earlier and what we've kind of talked about throughout this is as we get these kind of questions or as research, uh, to, you know, raises up questions, we, we're trying to plug that in. And so this is a, the next sort of stage of, okay, what happens uh, when? What happens after this? 
and you'll notice just to kind of, uh, and I, I see we're getting close to the quarter till, so we want to be able to take some questions here. Uh, so I we won't mess around with this too much. This is obviously open and available to everybody in the public. So you can certainly start experimenting on your own field. Uh, you will note that as you change, you know, the, the cash crop planning date, then we're running different numbers around it and trying to get a sense of how that would alter both our visualized outputs and our uh, uh, visualized carbon and nitrogen and biomass numbers as well as decomposition. And so we just uh, just added this decomposition uh, visualization towards the end of the year, early into this year. Uh, and we look to keep building building out from this. Um, and that is, I, I think, like I said, what we should get the questions here before we spend too much time. Uh, you can you can certainly uh, burn up a few hours in the day um, <laughs> working through this and and looking at how it how it works on your field. You know, one of the early questions we got about this uh, was around economics, and um, that is a question that we are very actively exploring how we can uh, plug in some economic analysis around this. That that is certainly one of our priorities. Uh, how to think through uh, cost and benefit numbers and get that displayed and visualized um, as well on this on this uh, on this tool and other aspects that, that Shalimar mentioned around the nitrogen cycle and how it's working through the decomposition, what that looks like, uh, also on our list. And of course, with all the talk about carbon and uh, carbon storage and climate change issues. Uh, certainly thinking through, you know, we've got this information visualized now. How do we help uh, the farmers if there are market opportunities uh, for that as well? So a whole lot of things that, uh, again, in in our, uh, our our series of wish lists of things we'd like to be able to do with this. Um, but we've got kind of our base layer to start with. This is the beginning uh, part of this process. Um, yeah. I want to uh, – sorry, go ahead, Shadowmark. No, I would just simply add with um, the carbon and water quality – uh, credit markets emerging, uh, we're definitely in position uh, in the future to to speak to uh, possible uh, uh, value added uh, due to based on your biomass, based on the carbon in that biomass, and based on the nitrogen that you that's in the biomass that's not uh, in the tile. And so, um, it, once once the matrix is set. Um, and based on um, carbon and nitrogen, those markets, then possibly uh, we could then inform farmers and help them visualize on their parcel of land, you know, what's my potential in these markets. That's right. So again, I just, we're going to run through some slides here real quick and get questions. Um, there is the website for those of you that want to try this on your farms and fields. Uh, we want to put a quick plug into AI Farms uh, here at the University of Illinois. Uh, they're inviting farmers to uh, do some small group meetings early April. Um, this is another chance to give feedback, another chance to sort of uh, provide information to researchers on what is uh, uh, what is needed, what kind of cover crop issues you have or want to see addressed or talked about. Um, talk to Dennis Bowman. His uh, email address is there on the screen if you're interested in that. We welcome all feedback and, and thoughts. And a big thank you to everybody that helped. I really want to thank uh, Illinois INREC for the incredible support of this development. Uh, we wanna thank the Walton Family Foundation as well for helping develop and, and particularly with the decomposition component. Of course, the, uh, the University of Illinois group uh, from Gardner to NCSA, the College of ACES. And we cannot thank Purdue University enough for allowing Shalimar to uh, be a part of this team and help us uh, with the design with his obvious expertise on this cover cropping practice and how it works. And just uh, some great work. This this team, I got to tell you, for somebody who has no uh, knowledge on on computer development or other things, this has been phenomenal. Sandeep and, and the team at NCSA working with Rabin and Shalimar and us to try to get this put together. Uh, hopefully you see the results uh, there on the screen in front of you. So we're going to jump to questions. Uh, team, I'm going to ask for uh, your help as well on these questions. First question, what is the base temperature used to calculate GDD, which is growing degree days for the rye? Um, what is the base temperature used? Rabin, I think that's probably to you. Do you know? Yeah, for uh, I can't remember top of my head, but if I remember correctly, for serialized GDD base is around a four degree Celsius around like, that would be like, I don't know, 30, 36, 37 degree Fahrenheit. I think that's the one we use. Okay. 
And then we got another modeling tool while we're while we're or a modeling question for you around. Um, oh, we're gonna get cameras on now. Everybody's gonna see us. So oh. smile. Um, there we go. What I do? Sand deep. Hey, uh, Rabin, spatial heterogeneity. Geneity. How do you uh -huh. calibrate the DSAT model in some sites? Uh, guaranteed performance in other sites in the US Corn Belt. Before you answer that one, uh, I don't know about the heterogeneity <laughs> question, but I will say. Oh gosh, now I'm on the screen. Now I'm yes. um, we have started with Illinois. So obviously we would love to get more states and more uh, areas into this, but we are uh, for right now working in Illinois uh, based on funding. So this, maybe some of that question is kind of in the, the category of the wish list of what we want to do down the road. But if you had any thoughts you want to add to that, uh, go ahead. Yeah, so in, in order to like uh, include special heterogeneity, especially I guess, uh, in terms of soil characteristic, right? Others are like major, right? For example, like your weather, that's your major. That probably we cannot do anything about that. So for the heterogeneity, especially for the soil, what we are trying to do is then, at the moment we're using uh, uh, our Sergo, and our USD NRCS Sergo database as a soil, a basic layer to run at the moment. And then we are doing the local, when we're doing the local calibration, we're trying to actually see just some of those identifies those sensitivity parameters, which helps us to calibrate for both water, nitrogen, as well as uh, crop dynamics altogether. And then we're trying to see then we can just come up with some generic, let's say modification, uh, how much we need to adjust. And we are trying to do that like not one site, not just a, but then multiple site state in Illinois so with a different soil type so that we can see uh, how does your model will, uh, we need how much we need to tweak this default so, uh, Sargo parameters, in the different condition we are trying to find out this, some generic correction that we have to apply depending on the reason. We are still in that work in the progress, but at the moment as we get more, this tool being used by more people in the more reason, and as we can see like, okay, some of the other, uh, uh, how does your model performance look, looks like, we probably, that will be our, ongoing model improvement process uh, over the next uh, few years. Yeah. Thank you. And obviously, I, the more data we get in, the more chances uh, we see this ran in real fields in real time with real weather data, like the, the better and better we can make this model and calibrate. So that's a great point. And again, Rabin, thank you to you and Rashab and the team that you guys have done an incredible job calibrating this and verifying the information and helping us along through the DSAT model. Uh, here's one I can answer. What does GDD rye stand for? That's growing degree days for rye. That is a cumulative temperature over that stretch of time that we're modeling. Um, so growing degree days. We mentioned cost and returns. That is one of our priorities to get some economic information in there. Uh, where can we find the species that are in the tool? 42 species. Who will add species to the tool over time? And the states that are covered. So this is another DSAT question. Uh, the 42 crops. This is an open source. Uh, in fact, you can just Google DSAT or uh, search for DSAT, I guess we shouldn't advertise for any one company. Um, and it will come up. So it is open. I don't know if, uh, Rabin, if you had any further you want to add to that. Yeah, so uh, so DSAT is actually so open source uh, software, which is developed by DSAT Foundation, so they don't make money out of it. Uh, so uh, And it's uh, actually currently supported by a group of scientists at University of Florida. So they are the one who do the uh, DSAT development and improvement. Uh, on a and then there's a ongoing. I mean, this uh, again, uh, it's a large user base used uh, throughout the world, and it goes through your let's say uh, routine uh, updates as we know more about the process, more about the experimental data set, and they keep on adding like your uh, more crops into the system. So it's a kind of system of your different crops model put together in a one big software package. Actually. Right. Um, Shalimar, we've got a decomposition question, so I'm going to pull you into the, the mix here a bit. Is the decomposition after termination driven by any weather data, or is it a generalization based on time only? Uh, in, in, in the field, uh, this, this was, so that data was developed. Uh, the empirical model, model from the data was developed from a field analysis. So with that said, um, the all of the climatic factors, right? Uh, environmental factors of, you know, ambient air temperature, soil temperature, moisture, humidity, all of those uh, played a part in, in the development of the decay curves that the model is using to predict uh, decay when you, when you run it through DSAT. 
and we're using a decomposition day uh, in that, right? Is what we're calling that part of it. So we are incorporating right. other data, yes. Thank you. Uh, here's a good example. Somebody suggests using NAS day suitable for uh, for planner and weather drive. That's a great suggestion that we uh, that take note of and appreciate some of that feedback as we think about other things that we could incorporate into this, other data sources. Um, let's see, can we upload our own KMZ or shape files for field boundaries now or in the future? Sandeep, that sounds like a question to you. And I think the answer is not yet, but that is something we want to work on down the road. I don't know what KMZ is. Right. I mean, yeah, uh, yeah, you're right. Currently the answer is no, we don't, we don't have that capability, but you know, yes, it looks like it's like, you know, it, there's a possibility that we could have something that we could do like in the future, especially in order to like, you know, get more like fine grained, uh, you know, boundary uh, for the field. Right. Uh, next question we have is what are you using for planting date and planting method for the cereal rye? So you can find that uh, we're using um, what we have. Let's make sure I don't lose the screen here. Here we go. Uh, we are using the information. You will, you will provide actually like planting date yeah. will be the user provider, right? In most cases. Yeah. I mean, we're using a cereal rye only. Um, if you go back into it, you can alter the establishment dates from a row, so drilled or broadcast and population and so forth. So that previous information can be there. In the actual year we're running it, are we? what was the base uh, planting information? I think we were just drilling it in uh, on, on the average numbers. Was it like, somebody help me on that. What, what we were using for, uh, for the actual establishment before you go back into crop history? We were... So you're asking for the seeding rate? The, what happened? Uh, the rate, yeah, how, how it was planted, how it was established in the rate of establishment. So we're drilling in at, at certain pounds per acre. How do we, what do we do for yeah. the, the base runs? I think base is we, it's being drilled uh, in after the harvest of the cash crop at a rate of about maybe 50 pounds or so uh, of rye per acre. So we're using a pretty standard amount and then that actually is a good point on, on some of the things we can continue to update and improve the information the farmers entering. Um, and again, I stress that what we have in this are defaults to just run this. And then it, the key is as you get more comfortable using it, you can um, tailor it better to your field information or practice information. Um, how much growth are you assuming on the cereal rye on say April on a, on a date specific? Now that's an interesting, do we have a date by date growth number on this? I mean, we've got a cumulative number in there, but I don't know that we pull out any specific dates growth. Uh, Rabin or Sandeep, do you know, mm -hmm. as we run that, we're running it daily. Or it runs it on a daily, daily scale. Yeah, month. daily scale, yeah. It all depends on actually particular day, like what happened earlier three months, right? Whether it was a wet winter versus a warm winter or, yeah. So it all depends on like what's happening before that particular date, like uh, how that's much biomass, how much, yeah. Yeah, that's an er interesting question about what you might want to see specifically and whether we tie that back to some of the improvement on weather data. So right now, I guess the, the simplest answer is you have to do the math yourself as from <laughs> the difference from day over day as we do see some growth there. Um, Preferred method of termination of cover crop. I don't think we have any method of termination in this at this point in time. I think we were presuming a chemical burn down. Um, but mm -hmm. from the model perspective, Shalimar or, or Rabin, effectively, we're, what the model does is shut off growth at, at termination. Yes. And that's, yes. that's what the, so the actual method of it. I don't know from the model's perspective uh, how much that would be a factor. Not really, like whether you incorporate it uh, with some mechanical way or you kill it with some chemical, I guess, like in terms of modeling. What we need to do is like, what is the day that you do that, right? What was the day you either apply your the chemical or the day you incorporate it? Like, that's the important for the model. Otherwise, it doesn't really matter how you do it because all happen is then that biomass is going to go back into your soil again or be organic nitrogen pool, uh, I mean, uh, your ultimately. So. We take note of that, whether that's something to dig into further on um, whether that would alter. And Shalimar, you might know from the literature whether we see any um, 
change in biomass accumulation or even nitrogen uptake based on the on the termination method? Um, I, I do not know. Yeah. Well, um, definitely, the, whether you chemically terminate or whether you physically uh, like injure the plant in order to terminate it, it's it's all about uh, the method by which uh, the method that gets the biomass, uh, the above ground biomass to lay down or be near the soil so that decomp can occur faster. So if your method of, of spraying, so normally you spray it and it stays standing until the planter comes through and knocks it down, okay? At that point, that's when the heavy interaction begins uh, with the soil microbiome uh, processing that, that residue. But if you roll a crimp it, uh, naturally you're breaking the stem and you're laying it down. So at that point, even prior to planting, you, you're already, um, you, you're putting the biomass, the substrate, uh, closer to the, the the microbiome that's going to process it. Yeah, and I think we just don't have the research on how that would impact decomp, but that's a great, that's another great question of, of yeah. some pretty specific management decisions and the interaction with cover crop, and then how would we build that into the model and get get that visualized out? So there's some great research questions, maybe some, uh, sure. some, some projects. Uh, be noted. Uh, somebody asked about row spacing, 30 and 15. Uh, I just jumped back into my farm. We're at inches, 29.92, but I think this is all converted from, we're in, uh, it's a metric in the model, right? So is that part of, okay. So I don't know if that answered uh, the question there, but we are, we have converted it into inches and feet, uh, the English system here in, in, the, in the model. Uh, we got a carbon to nitrogen uh, ratio question, and again, we're at, we're right at noon, a little bit past noon uh, central time. So we certainly understand if people need to drop off, but we'll try to get through the rest of these questions um, before we before we wrap up. Shalimar, uh, carbon to nitrogen ratio in the uh, in the tool. So we see this little drop off happening here early April. I, I don't know if you want to maybe talk through some of what we've been finding as we work through uh, this visualization and the modeling outcomes outputs. Yeah. I Actually, uh, you know, in in real time, that there's not um, a, a drop off that I believe occurs. However, with the model, uh, which is not going to perfectly simulate um, what what is natural, you see a, a little drop off. But actually, from December, let's say January to to April, that that could be uh, you know not significant. So that could be like a straight line. And then if we were able to simulate out further, you probably you would start seeing that CNA ratio begin to go uh, trend upwards along with the biomass, because we do know that uh, as the plant matures and, and transitions from vegetative to reproductive, uh, it puts on more, more, more carbon. And so then that's going to increase your CNN ratio. Yeah. And we've been, and we're, um, you know, using the biomass is kind of the driver on this. And so it could be that, that again, as we get through this and, and try to refine the modeling capabilities, that's, that's something we continue to work with. Uh, like I said, mm -hmm. we're working on the nitrogen loss reduction and uptake numbers to make sure we're, we're uh, meeting that. So we could see some changes around that, but it's a great point. This is why we appreciate people using this and that's testing right. this thing out. These are the kind of questions and feedback we need uh, to make sure we're, we're using it. Um, I am going to skip, uh, we got seasonal climate forecast uh, suggestions. So uh, we got note of that. Thank you uh, from Kansas State, uh, the suggestion around uh, some other weather data that we can look at. So we will, um, they've used DSAT on that. So this is, this is fascinating. This is exactly the kind of input we want. So we will take that back and look into it. Um, would you estimate that a two-way mix will be available this year by fall cover crop planting or next year? <laughs> um, that's a great question. and. I will I will go out on a limb here and with our development <laughs> schedule and time frame we will not be able to have a two way crop mix in there, um, but but we uh, we are in agreement with your question which is it's something we want uh, we want to be we want the ability to uh, modify the the models capability and the tools capability to really um, keep up with where farmers are I mean, Shalimar, some of the talk that we've had about some of the innovation going on with cover crops, um, there's just a lot of wonderful opportunities to build that innovation into this or allow the farmer to build that into it. We just, we're not there yet. And we're, we're trying to get this um, where, we, where we can uh, at, the, at the moment. Um, 
a mix. I don't know. I don't want to hazard even a guess on when we might be in that. Um, Sandeep, I, you're the you're the first uh, first lever that gets pulled on that one about our development schedule. So I, I think we're a ways out. Um, one of the questions is, and Rabin from that is that DSAT runs individual crops at a time. So we 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 haven't figured out how to like layer the the DSAT runs of multiple crops into that. So yeah. Uh, anybody watching, anybody that's on the webinar that has suggestions and ideas, we certainly welcome uh, some further thought, particularly any experts around uh, DSAT that have also been using DSAT in different ways, uh, some creativity on that. We would welcome some further feedback. Uh, looks like we got one last question, everybody. And this one, um, Silvita burst scores, Haney soil health scores might also be useful information to add to the models to simulate decomposition rates for soils with advanced biology. That's fascinating. Shalimar, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, there's some soil health indicators um, uh, that gives us an idea of, let's say the, the rate of CO2 emission in 24 hours, CO2 burst, uh, gives you an indication of uh, microbial activity. Uh, thus, that could, um, you know, enhance our understanding of the rate um, and the peak rate timing. Uh, there's also some indicators of, let's say, soil enzymes like uh, beta glucosidase and uh, urease that, that also gives us an idea of as that enzyme activity, potential enzyme activity uh, increases, we know that um, uh, if it's linked to the carbon cycle, that, that that's the activity that's metabolizing that residue. Uh, and so as long as our um, curves are is, is synchronized with those uh those particular curves uh of of like those enzymes then, then we know that we're right in there with predicting the peak activity um uh, in the decomp of the residue awesome well, listen we are past the uh, the hour I, I think we can only expect people to tolerate so much this i want to just sort of re reiterate um the questions and some of the feedback we're getting up here, particularly around cover crop mixes and some weather data, this is great. And, you know, this is a, like we said, this is funded with, with research dollars and, in, in a, in a, in the land grant university system. This is designed to be an extension and outreach and translation interpretation effort. And it is the feedback. It is the uh, interaction with other researchers that will absolutely help us advance this capability and build on it, build out from it and improve it. And of course, use by farmers and feedback from farmers who are living through the cover crop experience themselves in their fields with, with weather. I cannot stress how, how valuable that information and feedback is. And so we really appreciate it. Um, keep the questions coming to us uh, and let's open conversations when and where we can. Um, and we, we're gonna keep working on it. So. With that, uh, I want to again thank our funders, Illinois NREC, the Walton Family Foundation, and I want to thank uh, the team here on the screen, uh, Rabin, Sandeep, Shalimar, you guys are phenomenal. Your teams are phenomenal to work with, and we really, uh, and it's kind of exciting to be able to demonstrate this tool and, and get this up and running in the world. So we'll, we'll see where we go to next. Uh, with that, thank you to Jim for running the show again today, uh, everybody tuning in. And uh, we'll, you can find this on the FarmDoc website. It'll be archived there. Thank you. Have a great spring.